Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of JNHL with Peak Vibe Coding Champion Jordan. Uh, speaking of AI, I had a friend tell me that he was going to show me his Nano Banana this week, and uh, it turned out to just be an image generator. I was very, very sorely disappointed. Thought it was going to be better than that. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and check out what we've done this week. All right, so as you can see, I'm back in my childhood bedroom, and I'm using one monitor, and it's very small and all that, so apologies if things aren't overly clear, uh, or it just takes me a while to go from window to window, because I'm not too used to, you know, navigating around this way, but basically, this week, and kind of last week and a half, because I actually made last week's video a little bit early, um, was kind of all about Apache Spark. Now, I was really excited for this for a couple of reasons, so... Up to this point, I've kind of devoted a lot of my effort towards trying to make the data harness readable into Trino. So the first like four or five episodes of the series were me messing around with Trino. So I made a change to the hoodie uh, connector in Trino to try and allow snapshot reads. That actually still isn't in. Um, I made a connection to or, or uh, a cockroach DB change to try and create a cockroach DB plugin that would allow snapshot reads. And I also did something similar with Kafka, though looking back on it, the Kafka change probably isn't very necessary. I'm okay with uh, ditching that one. And so what I've kind of determined as I've gone on here is at least so far in, Hoodie, uh, in Trino, trying to contribute to open source has been a little bit challenging. Also, Trino is very clearly a popular query engine, and it very clearly works well too, which is awesome. Um, but I will say that it seems like if you look at the majority of data lake documents, they seem to prioritize getting connected with Spark over Trino. And I don't have any concrete numbers about how many users use you know, Spark or Trino, uh, but if an individual company that is in this space is saying, we're only prioritized making, making sure this thing is getting read from Spark, it maybe indicates to me that a lot of the demand in the data lake and big data space is probably going on uh, and the data is being queried through Spark. So I'm not saying I'm completely pivoting my focus away from Trino in eternity. I just knew that I wanted to get to Spark at some point because I know it's a popular querying engine. And similarly to Trino, it works uh, in the sense that you know, Spark can query from a variety of different sources and federate those together. So Spark can hit iceberg tables, Spark has Kafka connectors, JDBC connectors, stuff like that, and I wanted to employ them. And it's worth noting that because Spark and Trino are different, Spark actually has connectors that work in slightly different ways. Some of them are a little bit more built out than the ones in Trino, and that actually allows me to get a little bit further in building out this data harness. Because I think one kind of mentality that I'm trying to adopt in the coming weeks is the number of open source contributions that I have to make in order to make this project work is pretty much going to be the bottleneck here. If I have to make two open source contributions, however long it's gonna take me to make those two open source contributions is gonna be the amount of time that it takes to get this project done. Because it's very quick for me to go vibe code on my own and make something happen in my spare time, but it's very hard for me to get somebody else on board who's from an actual established uh, Apache project committee because they obviously have different incentives than I have. So that being said, I'm pretty much trying to do as much as I can internally, You know, release whatever jars I can and then make something that is as working as it can be before I try and, you know, publicize this project anymore and maybe see if I can get some initial actual users. So let's talk about what we did. Basically, what we're trying to do this week is we are creating a data harness catalog in the Spark repository. Right now, I was just creating it in the Spark repo itself. I cloned the code and was going from there, but eventually I'll take that code and move it into my data harness repo. Uh, because I just want it, again, like, I, I don't want to have to go through open source contributions to make this. I just want uh, an external jar that people can plop into their Spark project and start using the data harness. And so initially, what I was planning on doing, as you can see from my notes right here, was extending something known as the view catalog. Because like Trino, my initial thought was, I want to basically create a bunch of views where I have each view querying from every one of the individual sources that I care about, and then unioning back uh, together. And so, you know, I've got a bunch of to-dos here. These are just notes to myself. I was trying to read from Kafka before I even bothered writing any code, try to read from an iceberg table, try to read from a JDBC table. Um, and so initially you can see here that I was thinking about um, doing TyDB um, instead of any sort of Postgres compliant database. The reason I was using TyDB is because there's something called TySpark that we've spoken about on, uh, in this series before, and TySpark means that I can read from TyDB in Spark, and TyDB is a MySQL compliant database that allows snapshot reads, so I was very excited about that. But it turns out that I didn't actually even need to do this yet, and I'll show that in a little bit. 
uh, and I will get to TidyB, but now I'm mainly just rambling. So over here, I've got a bunch of notes for myself about how I actually ended up being able to read from Kafka. You can see that I had to pass in a bunch of bootstrap servers. I had to assign certain topics to myself. I had to specify their offsets. I had to then manually uh, deserialize the data from Avro and SQL. I had to take the substring of the actual byte array that I was returned because we're using the Confluent schema registry, so the first six bytes are devoted to what the schema name is. So there's a bunch of random stuff that I had to do and I had to figure out all of those quirks before I could actually write the code to replicate that process. So what ended up happening um, for myself here is I ended up deciding to use Yugabyte SQL or Yugabyte DB as the database that I will initially start with in Spark. So the reason for that is the following. I'm going to go to the Spark JDBC docs right now. And basically, when you connect to a JDBC source in Spark, so any like typical database, uh, Postgres, MySQL, any database that's MySQL or Postgres compliant, you pass in things like the URL, you pass in maybe the name of the database table that you're trying to read, maybe even a query if you're reading the same query every single time. Um, they have this thing called a prepare query, which is very interesting and I was considering using. So a prepare query is basically, um, rather than just providing a query, a prepare query is something that you run every single time you're reading from the database. And so that might have allowed me to specify the read timestamp uh, from the database that I want to use. So for example, if I want to read at time t, my prepare query might be uh, you know, set read timestamp to time t. Except the prepare query needs to be valid SQL. Uh, and when you're setting a session parameter like that, I don't really think it works properly with the prepare query. So instead, I found a different parameter that I could pass into the JDBC source, which is called the session init statement. So this is very nice, and it does the following. After each database session is open to the remote database and before starting to read data, this option executes a custom SQL statement or a PL slash SQL block. So now, you have a DB historic read. If I go over here, and I look at the actual time travel query docs of Yugabyte DB, unlike Cockroach DB, instead of specifying the timestamp that you're reading from in the query itself, you actually do it via a session parameter. And you just do it like this, set YB read time to whatever timestamp it is that you're reading from. So this works really, really nicely with that session init statement that I was showing off before. And as a result of that, I wanted to go with Yugabyte DB. If I can get CockroachDB working, that would be great too, but at the end of the day, they're both Postgres compliant new SQL databases, so I just care about getting one of them working, at least initially, and then maybe we can work towards the other one. But it was not hard to get YugabyteDB working, doing timestamp reads in Spark. I was able to prove this to myself pretty quickly by using uh, my integration test that populates a bunch of different data sources and then tries to read from them. And yeah, uh, that showed me that Yugabyte was the way to go. So the initial test that I basically wanted to build out was saying, if I populate a Kafka topic with Avro encoded data, a Yugabyte database, and an iceberg table, all of which have the same schema, and I try to read them all using either set offsets or a set read timestamp in Yugabyte DB and iceberg, can I actually do that? So why don't we go through some code in IntelliJ? Because now what I'm going to have to do, oops, is go ahead and show you guys what we've actually done. Some of this, again, vibe coded, so it's not gonna be the prettiest code, uh, especially the Scala stuff, just because I'm more used to writing Java, uh, but I understand what's going on, so I'll explain it where possible. Basically, everything in this Spark connector centers around this concept of the catalog interface. So in Spark, you have catalogs, and catalogs can expose namespaces and they can expose tables. I don't really care about namespaces right now because you can just think about namespaces as folders that tables live in. Um, so, you know, I don't really choose to override any of that. But all I'm basically doing in Spark is basically saying if a query comes in and we're trying to load a table with a particular identifier, first go and, you know, go to the data harness and say, can you go and load that table? And if you can, we're going to return something known as a data harness table. Now, the data harness table is very, very simple. All it has is a name, which is the same thing as the name that the user queried for, right? So if I'm querying for table X, the table name of the data harness table is going to be uh, table X. And the next thing that we're going to do is extract the schema, because now we want to basically take whatever the schema of our data harness table is and tell Spark that this is what the format of the columns is going to be. So 
How do we actually extract the schema? Well, keep in mind, in the past, we've made it so that we can associate an Avro or an Iceberg or a protocol buffer schema with a particular table. And that's on the client to basically set that for a table at a time. Now, fortunately, Spark actually has logic to convert an Iceberg schema to uh, a Spark schema, and it has logic to convert an Avro schema to a Spark schema, and same thing with protocol buffers. And so basically, I'm just going ahead and reusing that right here to re-extract my logic or to re-extract my column. So for example, um, you know, we've got this schema converters dot two SQL type Avro schema. This is actually just reading from existing logic that converts an Avro schema to a Spark schema because uh, Spark already has functions that allows it to read Avro data. That's what we're relying on for reading from Kafka. Great, so once we get our data harness table, you might be thinking, all right, so we have this random thing that we're calling a table and it has a schema but how do we actually convert that into a bunch of queries from a bunch of different data sources? And the answer to that is that we use something known as a Spark extension. So Spark extensions are basically allowing you to hook into a variety of different parts of the query lifecycle. And in this case, I'm hooking into uh, the analyzer. So we're creating what's known as a uh, query rule which is going to modify the query plan. And by modifying the query plan, I can basically say, hey, if you ever see a data harness table, instead of just trying to return a data harness table, instead return the union of a variety of different data sources. So let's go ahead and look at where we do that. Basically what we're doing right here in our data harness extension is we're saying inject this resolution rule, which is called the union table resolution rule. And you can see that lives right over here. In our union table resolution rule, what we're doing is the following. The first thing that we're doing is we're giving it the response back from our data harness, right? So we have our data harness table, and then we have our data harness schema, which is associated with that table, and the response, which is just the raw protocol buffer response that we got back from the actual data harness itself, which lists out what sources it has. Then once we have that response, we can go figure out what sources are associated with the data harness table. So for example, in this case, once we go through our sources, this is all AI written because I don't know shit about Scala, so don't judge me too hard. If the source has any sort of Kafka topic partitions associated with it, we are going to create a data frame associated with each one. So in this case, what we're basically doing is we're telling what the Kafka bootstrap servers are, we're saying what topic partitions to listen to, and we're saying the starting and ending offsets associated with that topic partition. We then create a data frame in Spark and then finally, the last thing that we're gonna do is we now need to deserialize the data from that topic because this is gonna be Avro encoded. So this is where we're basically using our from Avro Spark function, which already exists prior to me writing the data harness, to take this data and deserialize it back into the format that we want. So we basically take this data, we deserialize it into a struct, which we call val in SQL, and then we select val.star, which is going to pick out all of the individual fields that we want. Great, so that's how Kafka is gonna work. For Yugabyte DB, we're gonna do something very similar where we create yet another data frame. So we have all of our JDBC options which are encoded in the data harness reply itself. So we know the URL of the Yugabyte DB table. We know that the driver for a Yugabyte DB table is the Postgres driver. Uh, we know the table name itself. We know the username and the password because I put that in the data harness. And then we also know that the session init statement, which is the most important part, is that we're setting the read timestamp to whatever the read timestamp is that we get back from the actual data harness. So now once we've done this, when we read data from Yugabyte DB, we are reading it in a way such that we're seeing a snapshot read of the last known consistent uh, you know, snapshot of this database. Okay, I'm gonna come back here. Then finally, we're also going to load any iceberg data frames. This one is very similar, but also simple. Uh, we're reading iceberg data as of a particular timestamp and again, we get that timestamp from the data harness. By getting all of these timestamps from the data harness and loading them atomically, we can ensure that we're reading across these multiple data sources in a consistent way, and we're not gonna see the table in an inconsistent state. Okay, once we've done that, we now have a bunch of different data frames. We're gonna put those in a list, and then finally, from there, we're basically just gonna say, okay, now we have these data frames. They may not all have the same schema, let's go ahead and run a projection on them so that we project them to the proper output schema that we're expecting to get. So the remainder of this code right here is just devoted to unioning these guys all together and then projecting them in a way that their output schema is equal to the expected schema of the original data harness table. 
We do that using something known as an alias in Spark SQL, where an alias is basically saying, okay, all of these tables have the proper field name and field type, so why don't we just change their expression ID to be the proper expression ID of the output uh, table. And then once you do that, we can actually return all of the data. So let's see if I get demo affected right here. You can see that it worked just before, so I'm hoping it works again in real time. But if I select star from harness.dataharness.bootstrap, data harness is my namespace, harness is the catalog name, bootstrap is the table name, I should get nine rows. I do these three right here. The first three are from Kafka. The next three are from Iceberg. The final three are from Yugabyte DB. If you don't believe me, I'm populating that data all right here. Sorry, this thing's getting in the way. That is all getting populated in this script over here, where we first delete all three of the data sources, we repopulate them, and then we go ahead and put that in the data harness itself in a way such that Spark can then read it back. Anyways, guys, I'm really amped about this. Uh, this is like a pretty ideal outcome, I think, for let's say like one to two months of coding. Um, I'm gonna clean up this code a lot. Uh, I'm gonna try and consolidate it into the same GitHub repo. I'm gonna write some better documentation. Uh, I think that's gonna be the goal of this upcoming week. Um, and then I wanna actually try and see if I can put it out there and get some feedback from the more general public because uh, I think at the point where Spark is working and we actually have this kind of looking good, uh, there might be some real life utility for people who are building data pipelines here and that would be really, really cool. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm sorry I'm not speaking the loudest. My mom is in the background and I don't wanna nerd out too hard on her, but uh, I'm really excited about this and I'm looking forward to where it, where it goes. So uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. Have a great new year and I will see you in the next one.